For Kruma Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Shomunikai. Joining me today is microeconomic and political analyst, speaker and author Pumlani Majosi, here to unpack his book titled Lessons from Past Heroes. Welcome, Pumlani. Great to be here. Great to see you, Tabi. So what lessons from past heroes do you think today's youth can apply to post-apartheid South Africa that will give us a platform from which we can rebuild the country? Yeah, well, what motivated me to write the book was the nature of or the character of the people who came before us in South Africa. These are people before 1994. These are people who really faced tougher times than what we are facing today, right? They were marginalized. Uh, they, could, they didn't have a right to vote in their country. They were told who to deal with in terms of business, or whether it's in, well, not, in terms of schooling as well. So there were many restrictions. Yet uh, many of these people pushed hard to, to better their lives, right? In terms of education, in terms of uh, achievement in business, even in fields like music and film as well. So these guys, these were people who, given the little that was put in front of them, they could make use of it to better their lives. Now your question was what can young people learn uh, in the post-1994 era? What they should learn is that uh, you know, determination, hard work, pursuing opportunities that are given in front of you, um, that can better our life. And most importantly, at this point in time where we all now have a right to vote, we all have the, you know, we can deal with whomever we want uh, in the country, unlike back in then. So now we have the ability to hold our leaders to account, right? We have an election this year, an election that is very much watched closely. Now, in fact, it's being called our 1994 because of how critical the election is. And our citizens, our young people, they have an opportunity to reshape the, uh, the future of their country. And, you know, the people before 1994, they didn't, they didn't have that chance. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a chance now as people to reshape our governance, the future of our country, and to hold our leaders to account. So the lessons here are twofold. It's the nature of how do you push as a young person in the post-1994 era, how do you push to improve your life, given the op opportunities that exist uh, that are greater than what those guys, you know, faced back, back then. And, you know, um, even from an, an economic perspective, there, there are better opportunities now. So young people must look into what, can, what, what opportunities they can exploit, right, given the challenges that we, that we face now. And those challenges right now, are, are really, they are not comparable to what the people, the black people of the pre-1994 era faced. So, I mean, it's, it, it's really about determ determination, hard work, holding lead leaders to account, exploiting opportunities that are in front of you. That is what young people can learn. And in your book, you write that in the democratic South Africa, personal responsibility has also to do with the responsibility of the governance of the country. Yes. And you say that citizens have been negligent in ensuring a strong, accountable and non-corrupt. And that is evidence, as we can see, that the corrupt and incompetent ANC is still in power today. Yes. So what do you think has gone wrong in our country? And is it possible to rebuild? And do you think the ANC can self-correct? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, it's possible to rebuild this country. And that is what my book is about. I am saying let's rebuild this country, right? A country that was, in the first 20 years, things, I would argue, started quite well. Uh, this is under Mandela administration, under Thabo Mbege as well, in terms of their reputation around the world, in terms of economic growth, in terms of even unemployment rates. Uh, our economy was performing better. Uh, when you look at the data, in fact, we were growing in the 1990s era, early to, you know, 2000s, we were growing around the global average, right, in terms of economic growth. But we've lost all of that. Um, can we come back, is your question? Yes, we can come back with the right policies, and these policies would include reform in education, reform of the labor market. As we all know, the complaints about our labor market in South Africa, that the unions are very much dominant, it's very rigid, it's hard to reform it. Uh, so we need to look at those things. Huge investments in human capital, uh, equipping our young people uh, to be able to be globally competitive in terms, of, in terms of skills. We hear a lot of challenges on education. Uh, so we need to fix those things, beginning at a basic level. We need to get those things right. Tabi, I have said this country is a huge opportunity, especially since we've seen the decline 
of it over the past decade and a half now, right? Because even when you look at the GDP per capita, South Africans are poorer now than they were in 2007, right? In other words, we have declined from an economic perspective. Not only, not only grow, growth and in terms of GDP growth, but GDP per capita, we've gotten poorer, and that is what the data shows. So we have been on the decline over the past um, uh, more than a decade now, um, about 15 years or so. And uh, can we reverse it? The answer to that is yes. Now, your other question was, can the ANC correct itself? And my answer to that, I've been vocal about it, and I don't mean my, word, my words, they can't reform at this point the ANC. The only thing that would, that would really force them to, re to reform and self-correct would be for them to be out of power and sit on the bench and then reflect as, you know, be an opposition, reflect, restructure, change the narrative of what it wants, and then argue you know, the case for it to be re-elected back into power. But so long as they remain in power, I doubt we will see the real reforms that, we've, that we need. I mean, I mean, there, I mean, there is a lot of evidence to show the ANC governance failure, you know, the, the crime rates we see in the country. Uh, the murder rates over the past 10 years has, has, has risen, shocking unemployment rates, dismal economic growth, we are seeing the, these blackouts, um, we are seeing problems of education. So really, I mean, we can see that the government that we have right now has failed our people dismally and that a change is needed. And I do hope, which is what the case I, I, I make in the book, that South Africans will take that opportunity to hold their leaders to account in this upcoming election, uh, to, to reshape the governance. Because, you know, democracy uh, is stronger when people come out to hold their leaders to account for their actions, for their competence, for their way of governance. And um, it's a very critical time for South Africans uh, this year with this election. And why is it that black people's pre-1994 achievements are never highlighted or championed in public discourse? Mm, that's now, that's, that, that's what I, you know, I, I highlight in the book. That we've turned it to look at um, the, the pre-1994 apartheid fighters, you know, activists or you know, uh, anti-apartheid activists mm -hmm. as only political figures. You know, these are guys who really fought hard political activists who fought against the apartheid system. We've never looked into what were, th what were these people from a personal perspective, what were their achievements? You know, when you look at the guys that I cover, because I go back to early 1900s, you know, the founders of the ANC, those were remarkable people, Tabi. You know, people like Pixley, Isaac Seme, these guys went, they got educated overseas, Columbia University, went to Britain, some of them lived with them. You know, um, these were authors, you know, um, Saul Bladke spoke plus 11 languages, you know. He was a writer, a journalist, um, went to write overseas as well. These guys were so accomplished. John Langalibale Ledube, from my province, Bazul Natal, very much highly educated, went overseas too. So these guys, they, they, they were world traveled. They understood the dynamics of the time. Hence what, what motivated them to change their approach in the counter against the racist government of the time, uh, the Union of South Africa, which was a formation of basically uh, white rule um, that excluded black people in, in, in the governance affairs of the country. Those guys, to start the ANC, for them to come together nationally, it was a different thinking. Because before, as I say in the book, before we would, people always thought of, let's take arms and, 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 and fight these people. But these guys said, you know what, times have changed. Uh, we, we've come into the new century. Uh, we need to change how we counter this government. Hence, they mobilized to, you know, to start the ANC um, at the time. So I, I, I would say, you know, we, we don't highlight this, highlight, speak much about about this guy's achievements in education, in business. Thomas Mabigela, who is uh, on the cover uh, of my book, he he was a very a very interesting business person. That sort of, you know, Bloemfontein, very much accomplished business person, and he was really a driven person. And he was like, say, he was saying, look. I am doing amazing things as a black person in the face of, you know, uh, oppressive um, regulations, restrictions by uh, the then racist government of the time. You know, Tabi, what really drives me crazy at this time is that what we have tried to do, I have observed, observed over the years, is that we are creating this 
narrative and impression that nothing was happening for black people before 1994. You know, that there were no achievers. There was nothing. There were no economists. No, there were economists, right? There was NAFCOC, a, a black uh, business movement. I produced many great entrepreneurs in the country. Uh, there were businesses in homelands that were taking place. People were working, producing and selling uh, in those markets. And, and out of that would come achievers, right? Um, and we, we don't want to tell the story because we just want to say pre-1994, nothing was happening to black people. They were just, you know, being repressed. We should, there was no achievement of anything. We don't want to say, in the face of that, we had great people who came out and did amazing things. We should tell our history with, with, with pride and excitement that, you know, we are great people, which is what my book is about. We are great people, wonderful people, achievers have come before us. Uh, we can do it again. What can stop us now? In fact, now there are greater opportunities. We can do even much bigger things now given the fact that we are a democratic society now, we are an open society, we are now tolerant uh, of each other um, largely. We have a constitution that you know, acknowledges, acknowledges everybody. Um, so we really do have huge opportunities. And it, it always hurts me to see that we always want to start in 1994. We don't want to, sh to look before that as to what can we learn from great people who did amazing things. And also you say that slavery existed way before white people ensla enslaved blacks. So why is it that it's not widely spoken in politics that uh, slavery was there before the white people? Oh, that's an excellent question. That's because the history of slavery has been politicized for political motives. <laughs> people seeking politicians and, and those who, who are driven by, po by, by politics looking for for political gains slavery is a something that dates thousands of years back before westerners or white people if we can call them uh, could come to africa and move black people into the other side to, to enslave them and the way they were moved by the way um was that you had um black people themselves selling slave traders black slave traders mm -hmm. <laughs> selling black people who look like you and I, selling our own to Westerners, you know. Um, so, and there was slavery within Africa as well. Slavery is a, it's a, it's a, it's a worldwide phenomenon. It began way, in fact, it's something that dates even in Europe as well. Um, there was, you know, uh, slavery there way before um, Africans were enslaved or black Africans were enslaved by, uh, by white people. We, we overlook that history because remember what that history does, those facts, uh, Tabi. What they do is that they weaken the argument that slavery is only something that was done by white people on black people, right? And then they also now weaken the debate of this thing that, well, we need to have reparations, white people must pay for enslaving black people. If that's what you, if that's the logic you use, then we are going to, we have to say as well that, uh, you know, the, the black slave owners, there were thousands of black, black slave owners in America. In other words, these are black people who own black slaves. They themselves must also pay you know, the reparations as well. Nobody Tabi, speak, speaks about the Ara Arab slave trade, which was the enslavement of black Africans by the Arabs. Nobody talks about that in the millions. And in fact, it was worse slavery than Westerners enslaving black people um, or moving black people to, to, to the West. To, to enslave them. So then we are going to hear, I don't hear people asking the Arabs, all the Arab nations, Saudi Arabia, you know, all, all these nations in the Middle East, ask, asking their governments, where are the reparations for the uh, enslavement of black people? Why? Because people are selective. They choose things that advance their politics. So, so my point is that we've, the reason I raised that in the book is that as Africans, let, let, let's not think that we, somehow we always have this thinking that we are the, we are different somehow, we are the, we are the world's worst victims in history. You know, ev almost every racial group has been enslaved before, right? And almost every country around the world has been colonized. Let's, let, let's, let's do not look at self differently. Let's say, let's walk tall and say, look, you know, in Europe as well, there was enslavement. Uh, we can achieve anything now. We can build on what, on the on the difficult conditions that we faced before. 
we can fix our government, fix our education, fix our economies, fix our institutions, that, that's very important, whether it's economic or political institutions, uh, fix those to make them work, attract investment from other, from international investors. Th we are not different. That's what, that's the message of the book. We are not different. We are achievers. Um, we've, we've, um, anything we've gone through, other people, other civilizations around the world, they've gone through that. Let, let's build our continent. Let's, let's build our South Africa to make it one of the globally competitive uh, countries in the world. And do you think we are living up to the ideals of our forefathers? We do live to our ideals to an extent, though of course we have seen that going down uh, over the past, I would say over the past decade and a half now. The vision of Thomas Mapigela, uh, Pixliga Isagaseme, John Langalibalele Dube, Saul Musani uh, as well, all these guys, I think there was Alta Rupusana as well, um, uh, from, from the colony side. These are the founders of the ANC. Um, these guys, what they wanted, they wanted recognition and to, to be seen as equal in, in, in the country, to, 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 to participate productively in the governance affairs of South Africa at the time. That's what they were looking for. And I do argue that in the book. They, they wanted to, to, to work um, like everybody's working, pursue their, their interests, uh, uh, build their lives, build up their lives. Um, they were not looking for much um, from the state, that the state must do things for us and so on. But what, we're looking, what they were looking for was recognition in their country and to be able to, to participate in the governance affairs and in South Africa, over the past 30 years of its democracy, in the first 20 years of democratic existence, uh, this is post-1994, they were, the, the South Africa was, the narrative was different. There was a, the drive of rainbowism, you know, coming together, reconciliation project. No one was saying that was perfect, right? Which is what I highlight in the book. But it was a good necessary um, goal to, to reconcile and to take steps to to, to, to build that, um, that reconciliation project. Um, but I would argue that that was the first 20 years of our democracy, but over the past 10 years, I've seen things sort of slowing down in us coming together to, to you know, at least, at, at least attempting. Because remember, in the first 20 years, we are not saying that things were, were perfect with one another, no, but we, there was a process and an attempt to, to push through, to, um, to build a reconciled uh, a rainbow nation. But that has been, that has been on the decline. Um, especially, I would argue that people in general, they do work together and they do see that we have to work together. But I think the politics of it all, it has changed into something that can be very much racially divisive. We think somehow, Tabi, that pushing s such narratives um, is a blast to our, to our GDP growth or GDP per capita. It's not such things. In fact, it's coming together, which is what I argue in the book. It's coming together. Our unity can be our strength. And we all have equal responsibility. That some other people have greater responsibility and some do not. I do not believe in that. We all have equal responsibility, regardless of race or culture or religion, to really fix and address the, the challenges that we face. And they affect us all. And lastly, Pumlani, what are you who people take away after reading your book? Oh, I hope they take away that they are the drivers of their destiny. And when I say that, I'm not talking about, not only, my book, my book can sound like, when people sometimes they can hear me, they hear me, they would think that it's a, mot is he writing a motivational book or what? But it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's a political economic book, right, that deals with, that, 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 that says to move forward, these are the areas you should look at uh, in terms of the economy, in terms of governance. It also looks at the, the previous big policies under the ANC government. We could, we could go back to Kia, you know, um, those were Askisa. These are all post-1994 macroeconomic programs. So I reflect on them. I also reflect on the, the, the previous administrations or presidents uh, who, were, who were there and what, how I think about them from Mandela to, to Zuma and what we can learn and how we should reflect um, about them. People take two things. It's that it's um, you are the driver of your destiny, or you are the one who's, who's going to shape your future. Um, so that's from a more from a personal perspective. 
and you can learn from from guys like you know um Pixley guy Sagasemi, the founder of the ANC. Um and then look at how you can grow yourself. But then there's also then an element, another pillar, and that is this nation, this country that faces many challenges from an economic, social economic perspective. We all know what those are. And really be motivated to, to remember that even our governance of the country will be shaped by you as a South African. We can hold our leaders to account. Part of what we need to know and, and say more often is that democracy, the power of democracy is that when your leaders that you elected, you elevated to power, if they don't perform, you can change and give other people the opportunity. Because, Tabi, we've had this narrative that I keep on countering. I, I've been hard trying to counter this narrative that, you know, there's no alternative to the ANC or to the current uh, governing party. I'm saying no. Right now, as we speak in this election, Tabi, there will be dozens and dozens of political parties contesting this election, right? Um, we've had parties that have had experience in governing provinces. So in a democracy, you give other people a chance if others don't. And if those people also, they are not doing, uh, they're not satisfying your own governance, you change them again. So you, you always have to keep your leaders you know, uh, on their toes. And I hope that um, uh, what people take out from the book is that element as well, that they are responsible. We are responsible for the governance of this country how it is governed, and we must hold our leaders to accountable. And we must, we must be grateful that we have political and economic institutions that largely work better in contrast to other uh, uh, countries in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So, and, and many of these uh, institutions, they, um, there has been attempt, there have been attempts to, 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 to hijack, hijack them from, from politicians, but they have largely remained uh, independent. And we must, we must be thankful of that and remember that given the challenges that we face, it's us who can fix the state of the country and who can really make our country one of the great in the world. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Pumlani. Pleasure. Thank you so much. That was Pumlani Majosi speaking to Krima Media's Polity about the lessons from the past heroes.